Okay, we'll call the meeting to order at 7.02. It's uh, November 10th. Um, uh, first we'll do is review and pr approve the minutes from uh, October 6th. So moved. Philip will second it. You got a question? Yeah, I looked at the minutes. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I looked at the minutes just real quick just to make sure like I was prepared for this. And it said our advisor was Mr. Blinder, and it's just Ms. Ziomek, and I just want to make sure that was correct. Okay. Did you hear that, Judy? Uh, yeah, hold on. Thank you. Good catch, Maddie. I'm sorry, can you just correct me? It's Ms. Ziomek or Mr. Blinder? Which one is it? It's uh, Ms. Ziomek is our um, okay. advisor for student council. So we have a first and a second, and then I'll let Judy, when she's ready, do a roll call. Bob Halla? Yes. Ben Roberts? Yes. Bill Cantor? Yes. Judy Pierce? Yes. Uh, Mary Raymond? Yes. Damian Fosnott? Yes. Keith McFarland? Yes. Melissa Novak? Yes. And did Olivia join us? Is she on yet? Yep, Olivia. I see her as muted, but. No. She must be new at it. <laughs> Are you looking for me? Yeah. I am. Do you want to approve the extended minutes? Uh, yes. I don't Thank have a camera right now, so I have to be off camera. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We all set? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Shelly, financial statement, please. So I emailed out the monthly financial report as well as the expenditure report through December 31st. I'm not December. What am I thinking? October 31st. My kid can't start talking about Christmas. Um, <laughs> so we uh, had 19 warrants that you all reviewed totaling $12,207,455.30. Um, thank you for doing that. <clears throat> um, I don't have any... Million? Did you say 12 million? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. I'll weird. double check the number because it's a big number, but I'm, okay. I'm pretty sure that's what Donna gave to me. <laughs> okay. Um, I can't, it, that's all funds though. It's not just general funds. So it includes any other funding source that the school has. So I'll double check that she didn't have a um, typo in what she sent over to me. Okay. Um, so I don't have any, Concerns about general fund, we continue to monitor where there might be savings or overages on expense accounts. Um, if you took a look at the report, you know, things are certainly much more cleaned up with payroll than they were last month. Um, last month, Mr. Halla had asked some really great questions about some overages and certain salary lines. And I've worked with payroll to clean those up and get people in the right spot. So we're still a work in progress, but um, I think you'll see a lot more um, negatives there. You know, I'm also looking at accounts that we normally would have used um, for summer expenditures that maybe the summer programs either didn't happen at all or they were much smaller. So I'm sort of at this point now that we're a few months into the fiscal year starting to take a closer look at where we may have some savings that we can capture for unforeseen expenditures. But there's really nothing to report on for general funds concerns unless you have any questions. So I just got to help you out that there's no way that the warrants amounted to 12 million. So it's probably yeah, 1.2 that's what, it's probably 1 .2 it's, It might be 1.2. I'll, I'll double check it. Um, so school lunch update, this is something that we have been talking about for months now. Um, we have had it as a point of concern, a highlight of concern for us because we didn't know what we would be serving for school lunches and school lunches are also free for all children now. Um, so, you know, we're doing okay. I, I think the number of lunches that have been served in school is increasing. October has been a full month, so it gives us a good snapshot of the revenue projections for the rest of the year. 
Um, we've served around 1,500 lunches, 250 breakfasts, plus we've had about 1,100 additional pickups on top of that from community members. Uh, so our revenue year to date, and the revenue is primarily based on government reimbursement. Um, it is not based on our typical school lunch revenue. Um, there are some a la carte items being sold, but um, certainly nowhere near what we're used to seeing. So I did give you a year to date. We're looking at revenue of just under 35,000. However, our expenses year to date, including payroll, have been 44,000. So our net income year to date is already about $9,500 in the hole. We had some funds in that account going into this year. So uh, the current balance in the revolving fund after the year to date transactions is just over $1,100. Uh, so obviously we will not be able to continue to pay wages out of there. This is something that we did talk about um, month to month. And I'd like to make the recommendation that we move the cafeteria wages off of the school lunch revolving account onto the general fund moving forward. Um, with the projections that I have in for revenue and expenses, um, we will be able to cover food and supply costs, but we will not be able to continue to cover the wages. So we have some savings in the general fund, um, whether it was you know change of staffing here or there, and we had uh, someone come in at a lower step than the prior year, or if the position that wasn't filled. Um, so we are able to absorb that into the general fund and not use any other funds. Uh, and I'd like your support to go ahead and make that change retroactive to the beginning of the year and moving forward. Bill? So, so I have a question about that, Shelly. The, I mean, the, the, the rationale behind putting the, the wages um, of the school, of the cafeteria in the cafeteria account was to get a more accurate picture of the uh, profit, loss, revenue, whatever, whatever you want to call it, of the financial picture of the cafeteria. And when you, when, when you, when you cut you know, when you take part of that picture and put it somewhere else, then the picture becomes harder to find or to sort together. So like, I mean, rather than putting the employees into the general fund, can't we put the general fund into the cafeteria account? No, I mean, you can't supplement a revolving fund with your general fund expenditures that I'm aware of. I will look into it, but I'm not aware of any instance where you can take chapter 70 or um, local funding from our towns and move it into a revolving account. But I can certainly check with the auditor. Um, I can tell you that the coding system is really clear for the general budget. And I will be able to easily identify, uh, if you were to look at the expense report, the code for cafeteria wages is 3,400, which I believe is on page... Um, seven of our report. So right now you can see that just the uh, portion of Mary's salary, the food service director that we pay is going into the general fund, so not the regular cafeteria staff. And we would have a separate line item in there that would track that. So I can manually create um, a true picture of what the revenue and expenses are so that we can see what the net income is still based on the program. But we can't run the um, school lunch account into the negative. We'll have to supplement it at some point. We could let it go for now and wait until later in the year to see how much we have to move over, or we could make the shift at this point and put the wages onto the general fund. But either way, um, I think we are gonna have to pay for them from another funding source. See, I mean, I, I, I think one, one of the things is that I, I felt this for a long time that it's wrong to expect the cafeteria to pay for itself in any school. And that when the food service program that was established by the federal government in the seventies, if they kept up just with inflation, the schools would be getting $9 in reimbursement per meal. Um, and that, that, that's the whole alpha and omega of the whole story. But like, I, we sh I, I think that it's okay to put money into the, to, to treat it like it's going to be a loss leader, um, and and that that's just the way that works. It's it, you can't. It, it's so it's so hard to, to serve palatable food with uh, and have to keep a positive balance in your account as a cafeteria director. It's just they don't give you enough money. Period. 
And I don't disagree with you. I think the challenge that we face, and this is not just unique to Frontier, it's at all of the schools, um, outside of the food service director, the wages for staff have been paid from revolving funds. So at Frontier for the year, that's a total of $75,000. So if school lunch can't support that staff, then we have to have another funding source and $75,000 into our general fund budget on a normal year when we don't have savings and there hasn't been all of this crazy fluctuation, that's a big percentage to add in, which is a reality that we're gonna have to face looking at next year of how we fund those positions because the work is not going away. You know, the same staff are needed, the same hours are there. Some of them are actually working overtime because not overtime as overtime law, but they're working harder um, because they're bringing meals to the gym and things like that. So, you know, I, I agree with you, um, but it's, it's gonna be difficult if we can't fund those positions from its own revenue. Um, I feel I think I think you're you're right because if Mr. Decker was here, we'd be hearing an earful from Mr. Decker. So um, I, I personally think we should I think we should wait a little bit, like Phil says, and unless somebody else wants to chime in on this. I mean, part of it too is that we've already been you know be, because the benefit stream that that the employees in the cafeteria get are already compensated through the general fund there's already part of the picture that we're not getting and we're already artificially, not artificially, but um, you know, it, the, the books in um, it doesn't, we're, we're not, we're not reflecting our true and accurate cost um, in, in that line item already. Um, and, and it's, it, it gets harder. That, I mean, that's what, that's all that, you know, sorry. Yeah, no, you're right, Phil. We're not capturing all of our costs in here. There's certainly insurances and things like that that are liabilities for the school that we do pay from general fund, which is the case in any revolving program that has revenue coming in. We never fully capture it in, in the funds. Sped revolving is the same way in our early childhood programs. It's the same there in the elementary schools. Um, we can certainly hold off, you know, uh, Frontier's pot of money goes into one bank account. So it's not like the account is truly negative. You know, we have funds to continue to support the expenses and the wages. Um, but the account as a whole, by the end of the year, we will have to rectify and make sure that we do put it at least in the positive. Um, we don't have to carry a surplus by any means, but, you know, we can't carry it negative year to year. We will be required, whether that's with e and or general fund money or school choice money, whatever it is, we will have to make sure that we do rectify and balance out the account. All right. Sorry. So I'm happy to do whatever you all would like to do. Can I, can we, you know, once we get going on this a little bit, can we, I think we did it in Waitley for quite a few years because it was always in a negative. Can we take money out of, out of school choice? to take care of what we're talking about versus unless, unless we did have a lot of programs, not, you know, happening, um, you know, during the summer months and there's a lot of money there that could offset it. Yeah, I, I, we can take it out of school choice. It doesn't matter what other funding source it comes from in the end, it just has to get put to a hey. positive balance. Um, and if we have general fund savings available, there isn't a reason to not use those funds, you know, unless we want to continue to build up E&D and spend down school choice. But six in one half dozen in another, you know, it's still sort of this revolving money for the school. Um, but we will have to make a decision. Keith, did you have your hand up? I thought I saw you have a comment or question for me. Yeah, I'm just wondering if this is a temporary recommendation or is this one that you would recommend going forward? Like, yeah, That's a really great question. So I, I don't have an answer for that at this point. I think it's partially dependent upon what the government decides for lunches for next school year. If this USDA program continues um, and free lunches are for everyone, we're not making the same amount of money as we were if students were paying for lunch on their own. 
Um, the other thing that we have to do right now that's bringing down significantly our revenue is um, change what we're serving. So the amount of a la carte items that we normally have for students to buy are not available. It's very minimal choices. So, and that's because of where lunch is located. You know, lunch is not just in the cafeteria, it's also in the gym, which you have to have portability with things. Um, and kids are also eating outside. So if we can bring back our program to some normalcy, I do think revenues can increase again. Our food service director has done a great job from my understanding, although this is my only second year working with her, she's done a really great job of balancing out all of our programs and getting us um, back on good terms as far as product that we're serving and then being able to support our wages. So. I think some things will have to change back to what they were last year in order for us to be able to make some money. Uh, we are going to have to consider whether or not we can pay for wages next year out of this fund. Because as of right now, there's no surplus. I mean, like I said, year to date balance is $1,145.57 in the negative. So we have no savings right now in the school lunch revolving fund. So we're starting out FY22 not in the best position in this account but again we still need the staffing there to serve lunches to families so can we not a can great we, position to be in can we go through another month and just see what happens with november and see how how worse it got or did it get a little bit better with you know i would you know does anybody else want to chime in on that sounds like a good idea or or should not I such a bad idea well, we can start to project out based on where we are. You know, we've had a, about a, a month of normalcy of what the amount of meals going out are. I mean, you have to remember, folks, that the, the, the government's paying for lunch, but they're not paying for the full amount. So we can start to decide right. we can start to figure out what's the what's the subtraction rate of how far we'll be in debt by the end of the year. And it's the same problem all schools are having because they're the reimbursement program is not paying for the actual cost of doing the meals. So everybody gets a free meal said to the government and but we're not they're not actually paying for it all so um so we'll be able to project that out and that's i think that's what shelly's trying to prepare for knowing that it's going to come out less but yeah and I, I mean i've definitely looked at those projections i can put it more concretely together for you to look at october is a month where we have the highest number of food service days because there's only one holiday um i think it's 21 or 22 service days in october um and i think our uh, revenue for October alone um, was just shy of seven thousand. I mean, not seven, nine thousand dollars. Sorry, I'm tired. It's late. Clearly, I'm making mistakes here. Nine thousand on revenue, and our expenses for October alone were fifteen thousand. So we're not making money here. We're covering our our food, and we're not even fully covering our food costs. Um, month to month. But I'm happy, you know, like I said, we can leave it the way it is for now. Happy to do that. We'll keep it as it is. I will put together um, a paper projection for you all to look at based on the September, October, November. We won't wait. Yeah, we'll have November done because I don't think we meet until like the 12th or something. Um, and then you can see what the actual projections are on paper and we'll take a look from there. Thank you. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you very much. Um, so I have a couple of other things to report on. Uh, I wanted to give you a COVID expense update. So all four of our towns, Conway, Deerfield, Sunderland, and Wheatley have supported our request for Municipal CARES Act funding uh, for Frontier Regional. So our expenditures that we submitted requests for are $176,000 for items related to PPE, cleaning, school distance learning, and social distancing. Um, so whatever each town's portion is, I'm working on gathering the bills with my staff and we'll submit those to the town for reimbursement. We have to pay for them all first and then they'll cut checks back to us. So we're thankful for that support because Frontier did not have access to this particular money because it was specifically municipal related. Um, and so they had to go to their select board and ask for this money. The town administrators advocated on our behalf. So I do appreciate their support in this and the town support as well. 
Um, and then we also had Frontier was awarded its own DESE grants for COVID related expenditures of around 160,000. There's a small amount of money left to be spent there. We're talking with um, administrators on how to spend that currently. It looks like most of it will go to technology at this point, um, but I'll work with George and Sarah to make sure that those grants are spent down in a timely fashion. Uh, and then two of our towns have requested uh, budget information for FY22. Um, Conway and Sunderland are sending out their own budget calendar and have requested that we start working on all of that. Um, you know, Darius and I, they're talking about there's so many unknowns and um, we don't even have a budget for FY21. It's hard to start planning for 22, but it's certainly on our mind and we are starting to think about all the various components that go into building that budget in such a financial um, uncertainty or uncertainty. Yeah, so Shelly, just on that book, so I went to the Sunderland Select Board meeting last night just to have a conversation with them, um, just kind of giving them a general overview. It, it's very difficult for us to come up with a budget. Um, again, I, you know, I know some of you guys, this is old, this is old hat, but you know, we don't know our revenues. We're like our own little town until we get the, the cherry sheets for, our, for next year. We just are getting the cherry sheets for this year right now. Until we get the cherry sheets for next year, we won't have any idea what our what our income is to base a budget off of. And so, you know, we obviously, we're gonna, we're gonna start looking at services and, and maybe, um, you know, and from both towns, I was asked for a level service budget or a level funded budget um, for another straight second straight year, which is actually a, a reduction. And remember that we paid for um, that reduction at a savings we had last spring from the shutdown. So we're actually gonna be looking at from a, and Shelly, help me out here if I'm if I'm misspeaking, okay? Just because I, I kind of go down this road where I, I kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, that we're talking about possibly up to a five percent decrease just out of the gate if we're level funded, um, and that's before we get insurance numbers that could go spike up and some of those other things that we because we operate as our own kind of our own region, our own municipality is how we kind of act. So for them to ask us to have a budget in early January, it's not really reasonable, but we can start getting. And I, I talked to them about that. It was just about, it's about a season about we have to be far more transparent than ever because it's going to be tight for all of our towns. It's not a year where we can come in and, you know, five or 6% or what are we going to need? We're going to have to work really closely with them because they're going to get hit across the board on things. And so I went there last night and basically just said, you know, we'll communicate, we'll continue to communicate through this, um, both at the elementary and at the secondary level. Um, Conway was also, I had a conversation with Tom up there and he understands the schools are a little bit different than the other it's a general letter going to all departments but there's going to be also more need to be more communication because the way this budget cycle i'm going to guess is going to happen it's going to be kind of wait 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 then fast and furious if we're going to make our normal timeline and so and if it's going to be fast and furious without with reductions that's a lot of work on on all the administration and on you folks as we try to figure out how we do that in a way to you know keep the best programming moving forward. So, just letting you know, we're you know, on a side note, Bill's not here tonight, but we do have to get the budget subcommittee kind of getting going as well to start meeting with us. Probably a, a next meeting, I'm going to say Shelley, probably sometime in December, which is a little bit earlier than we usually do, um, to start talking about what does it look like just shifting the numbers over what we do know. And then I saw you raise your hand for one positive thing. The Pfizer thing that came out yesterday is really positive for us because now at least we have some idea that we may have a normal, some sort, some kind of normalcy for next year. I don't know if it's going to be exact, but right, you know, going into planning the budget phase and not knowing if we're going to be a hybrid remote, that kind of stuff, maybe we'll have vaccinations. You know, I looked at Missy and maybe what, what your thought is on that from, from what you're hearing out there in your field. But, you know, you know, could most people be vaccinated by, by summer? Um, that's the, you know, we can all be hopeful. Don't shoot us down yet, Missy, because we're all hoping that's the case. I know everybody's hoping, but we got to, we're, they're still in, they've got a few weeks before they can even get the data out. And then we need to have like actual scientists, not uh, public speakers on news, uh, on news organization. We have to have them tell us what things look like. So I, I know it's exciting, but I'm just. <sighs> Camp it down. Whoa, someone, someone. And there's some some big logistical things with this. So, right, so but, it's got to be cold. I guess the one thing I was saying is when we build our budget, not knowing what the model is also is extremely difficult. We start looking at staffing and that kind of thing. Um, and obviously, the model we're in is a more expensive model than the normal. You know, so it's just very, um, 
it, 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 more information we get is going to help us along. So, all right, I, I talk too much. Sorry, Phil. Sorry. Phil, you want to say something, Phil? Yeah, I mean, just a couple things that I mean, I, just because the town administrator asks for something, it doesn't really mean that that's what the town wants. Um, it's just what the town administrator wants. So, you know, they they always want a level funded budget because there's so many other competing claims in every other town department every year. But, um, you know, if the, there is, a, I mean, I, I and, and part of it, you know, the, the, the towns have a budget process. You know, we voted on the budget process. The X day of X month is when X something happens. And this and, and this, so they treat that this year just like every other year for, for that purpose. And, um, you know, there's this is certainly the year I would think to throw all that stuff out the window and um, just survive as best we can with the limited amount of information that we get on a daily basis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all that being said, from what I understand of the state projections of, of what the numbers were for last year's budget that they finally gave us, those were sort of better than what we had hoped for. And for I, I know from all of our four towns, the municipal tax revenues are better than what we had hoped for. Um, that, that the, you know, the, the worst, I think most, most of us are sort of pretty comfortable saying that the worst case scenarios for this year and for next year, finance wise for the town and for, for the towns are not going to be coming true, that it's going to be better than that. Um, so, um, you know, hope, hopefully we're not, yeah, yeah, but I mean, hope, hopefully we're not like seriously considering entertaining a level budget this year again, that that's. The, the hardship and the uh, craziness that that would entail um, is just not something I'd like to really, you know, the, and the other part of it too is that, you know, I'd like to avoid the thing that we did last year, which was, um, you know, the, the, the school administration doing the five towns budgets, school budgets over and over and over again. Um, and the, I mean, or that the, just the more in for new information and, you know, da, 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 and everything just kept changing. And it'd be nice to kind of avoid that and just to do them once. Um, so all, um, that's so what I'm I trying have, to say. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Know, you what I'm trying to say is just follow your own schedule. And, um, you know, you're, the school is the 900 pound gorilla in the budget process for all the towns. And, um, you know, it's just, just know that. So. Okay. So I have um, one last comment, um, which is a little bit contradicts what Phil just said that the towns are feeling like the numbers are coming out better because I did look at the cherry sheets that came out this week. Um, House proposed their first draft, I believe of um, funding and for chapter 70 for FY21, they are looking at level funding, which is what the governor had put in his most recent update as well. Um, level funding for Frontier actually means a loss of $17,000 of chapter 70 funding. So if that is what the state ends up voting on and moving forward with, we will have to consider how we're going to make up for that budget shortfall because we will have a loss of revenue there. Um, and all of the towns are seeing a little bit of a loss. Frontier is seeing the most. Um, Deerfield and then the you know other three smaller towns are not seeing as much after Frontier and Deerfield. Um, and really that loss is, all they're doing is they took away any um, SOA money, which we really didn't get the Student Opportunity Act funding. What we got was the $30 per pupil based on the foundation budget. So they're just backing that out at this point. So that extra 17,000 we thought we were gonna have, um, we don't. So we'll see what happens, but that's just one more thing to put on the radar that we may have to be having conversation about how to fund that shortfall. Thanks, Shelly. Sure, um, and Judy, I will get you the warrant number. I apologize on that typo. And Bob, I'm sure if when you signed them, you saw a $12 million warrant, you would have been <laughs> in my office. So, you know, clearly I've got a number off there. So I'll email you the right number, Judy. Okay, thanks. Thank you. But I'm not sure if I even signed it yet, so. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, I've been in the woods too long, so you know. Um, did anybody else have any questions for Shelly before we go on? Okay, we got public comment tonight. Um, I think we have a couple people that want to speak. Um, is Jennifer Smith, I think, is going to speak first? Am I correct? Sure. Hi, I'm a, hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. I just wanted to share a little bit of work um, that's happening in the elementary schools and share some gratitude this evening. So thank you for you. Uh, my, thank you for giving me some time. My name is Jennifer Smith, and I am a fourth grade teacher at Deerfield Elementary. Um, after the events in the world and hearing from over 200 alumni of Frontier, the district began working over the summer to develop a task force, an anti-racism and equity committee. In addition to this district committee, I worked with a small group of elementary teachers to develop a 10 week long professional development series for our elementary staff and faculty. We work closely with the district consultant, Amanda Mosea, to have district wide workshops for the elementary teachers, pre and post reflection data and small groups doing pathways of study for our approximately 200 staff and faculty. The elementary schools are about to complete their first 10 weeks where we've dived deep into the history of racism in this country and the development of identities and white privilege. We're doing this work in order to know how to address biases, stereotypes, and well-intentioned but nevertheless problematic messages that are sent to our, all of our students. Through this work, we will be able to developmentally and appropriately confront, challenge, and work to undo systematic racism that is prevalent in our schools. These topics come up at all levels and teachers need to be trained and prepared to guide their students through it. I wanted to express my great appreciation tonight to Darius and especially to Kim McCarthy, who supported our work and pushed for a large amount of time for the teachers to do this personal work required to be comfortable and skilled in this area. I know the school committee members would agree that this is important work and must be supported and required for all staff, faculty, and administrators so that our families and students of color begin to feel heard and prioritized in our community. I'm excited to continue this work in the elementary schools through the winter, and I'm looking forward to hearing what the administrators are working on to become leaders on this front. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Jessica, are you there? I am. Um, I'm going to share my screen as I speak. Um, there's, there's one sort of visual component to what I would like to say. All right. I hope you can see it. I can start reading it even if you can't see it yet. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard tonight. I serve on the Joint Labor Management Committee of a neighboring school district where I teach. We're currently working to revise the district's metrics policy. As part of this work, I have closely followed Massachusetts Department of Public Health's COVID, data, COVID daily and weekly data for more than two months. And I've studied metrics policies from several school districts in our region and examined many, many online data trackers from around the country. It is from this experience that I want to share with you a critical perspective of the state's newest metric system and how it applies to smaller municipalities like the four foundation towns of Frontier Regional. The new system was touted by state leadership as being more conservative than the CDC, but this is only true for cities with populations of at least 10,000. It is categorically false for towns under 10,000, which are now subject to a completely different set of rules. Under the new system, our small municipalities were not served well because it was based on average daily per capita cases and our small populations made our towns overly sensitive to single cases. There was no nuance allowed for contained clusters like a single household in town accounting for three, four or five cases. DPH tried to manage this challenge by saying that towns would not receive a color coded rating with less than five cases. This meant that five cases in Deerfield within two weeks would earn a high yellow rating and a sixth case would make Deerfield red. For the other three towns, there was no possibility for ever rating green or yellow. The fifth case would put all of us deep into red. With the revised metrics, the state eliminated that problem by setting a separate metric for all towns with populations under 10,000. It is a raw number. Red for all of us is now 26 cases in two weeks, regardless of population. 
Let me back up to compare Massachusetts metrics to the CDC. It's critical to understand that Massachusetts has always used a metric of average daily cases per 100,000 people over 14 days. The CDC's metrics and maps all use average total cases per 100,000 people over 14 days. If you're comparing Massachusetts old metrics or our new metrics for towns above 10,000, with the CDC metrics, you need to remember to divide or multiply one of those figures by 14 in order to make an accurate comparison. Since we've probably all been following Massachusetts data expressed in daily per capita rates, here is the comparison expressed in familiar figures. Um, if you can't see this, could somebody interrupt me and tell me? Um, so the threshold for red rating until through last week in Massachusetts was eight cases per 100,000 people average um, over the last two weeks. Now for the towns that have at least 10,000 people, that has been bumped up to 10, plus they also have to qualify uh, depending on the city size with um, their test positivity rate. The CDC's metric is the equivalent of 14.2 cases per day. A town of 10,000, so now we have this 26 case rule. If you are at the top of that range, your town has 10,000 people, it's a daily per capita of 17.8, but it's the same raw number for any town under 10,000. So under the new metric, Deerfield needs a, a per capita of 36 cases a day. Sunderland needs 50, Conway is 98, and Waitley is 117. As you can see, the 26 total cases rule may work okay for a town with 10,000 people, but for Union 38 towns, we would be in relatively catastrophic circumstances before we earned a red rating in the eyes of Boston. I have already written to Joe Comerford and Natalie Blay about the unsuitability of this new metric to ask what could be done. I urge all FRSU 38 school committee members and district leaders to join me in rejecting the new metrics from the state because they do not promote safety in our towns. As I was told by an epidemiologist yesterday, Dr. Megan Harvey of Springfield College, they're not supported by science. There are other more nuanced ways to examine local and regional data and determine the need for pivoting between educational models. Meg Birch is doing a fantastic job of examining and promoting these approaches, not to mention collaborating, collaborating with all of our boards of health to include a wide range of local expertise in the revision of our district metrics policy, and also in future conversations if and when the time to pivot between models comes. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak and thank you for your service to our district. Thanks, Jess. Uh, Meg, do you wanna chime in on anything that Jess uh, presented to us? Hey, Bob, it's on our agenda tonight. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, we have no other public comment unless somebody in our group wants to say something. Uh, how about student council report? Yay! Um, <laughs> so most of you all probably know who I am, but for those who don't, I'm uh, Maddie Leone and I'm the vice president of student council this year. And recently we just put out a survey, I believe this Friday or Thursday night, um, to all of our students that we have at Frontier, sort of asking what they think about Schoology, what they think about our hybrid versus remote, what they think about Google Classroom, how are the issues working out, are they motivated, are they not motivated? And so far we've, we've received 124 responses, which is not as many as we'd like, but we'll take it for right now since it's been a few days. And I just want to share sort of the most important bullet points, I guess, that we had that they asked me to talk to you guys about. So the first one is typically most students are motivated to, to come to school. Over 60% um, said that on a scale of one to 10, six to 10, that they would, that they're really motivated to come to school. But in this sort of hybrid remote uncertain time, we now have that same percentage rating it from a five to a one, which is disheartening, but you know, we're hoping it's gonna pick up and we're gonna send this uh, a similar survey out sort of towards the end of the year to see if maybe motivation's increased because that's kind of what we hope. Um, it looks like a lot of people um, are really, really happy with the COVID-19 uh, safety precautions that have been put in place. Um, 
there's been a few people who are not, um, but over half of the people rated the COVID-19 precautions very, very highly. Um, and sort of, again, looking at Schoology versus Google Classroom, a lot of kids, again, are struggling with losing assignments in Schoology. Um, there is a function on Schoology where you cannot submit multiple documents to a question, which is making it hard when teachers assign something that is many parts and they then have to assign, make separate assignments, and it's hard to keep track of. Uh, that's sort of the feedback that we're getting. And we also found that 70% so far have said that it's easier to organize our school workload on Google Classroom. And then we asked uh, kids to reflect on that uh, because, you know, we like to have that. And it's saying, that Schoology causes Wi-Fi, mic, and camera problems, um, and also that the calendar isn't as prevalent on Schoology as it is on Google Classroom. Google Classroom, it's in your face, and you see it right there. And it is on Schoology, but you would then have to scroll to find all of your assignments, which can be tricky for some students. Let me see. A lot of people seem to be having uh, more than three times a week troubles with Schoology. And we hope that that's gonna change sort of going into the next semester and the next quarter. And everybody, 86% of people are happy with whether they chose hybrid or remote. And then we sort of had an open-ended question at the end where we let students respond as they saw fit. They could comment on anything that we asked them to. And sort of the common theme is that students are finding it really, really, really hard to focus in class and to stay on top of assignments because they're on the screen for six hours for school and then homework is also assigned online so that can be another three to five hours with a total of sort of nine to 13 hours online which is crazy especially for somebody with a developing brain so just that's been sort of the biggest concern that we have and we are looking to i've been talking with our president isabel and we are finalizing our plans for spirit week so that way we can um have a meeting with mr lanius and mr dredge um with a concrete plan and not just um willy-nilly ideas so look for that in the next report we sh we're trying to get that up and running hopefully in december before we head off to break and before sort of the new semester begins that's one of the things that we've been really trying to focus on as well. And we did have Toga Day that we had Monday and Tuesday. Huge success. Everybody loved it. Everybody was wearing togas. And we were all on the football field. We had a grand old time. And it was just really nice to sort of see that sense of community and spirit in a time where it's been really hard to see that and to get the pictures from the online students who weren't able to make it but still want to participate of them in their houses sort of in their togas and it was just really awesome to see that any questions and also once we get sort of two weeks with this survey um, and in the next report um, we will report back the full findings of our survey can you um, also uh, maybe do it on a document and we can get it emailed ahead of time to us as school community members? Absolutely, member? yeah. There's a, I can pull up all those charts for you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? No. Phil? Yeah, first, I just, uh, I, I, nominate, I nominate you for the student <laughs> representative to the school committee hall of fame. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Uh, the uh, you know can can can, uh, can um, um, George or or Scott or someone address the school schoology uh, um, concerns or. So, Phil, so it's one of those things that it definitely is on our radar and Scott Paul, who's our, you know, who Scott is our IT director. Uh, it's something that he's been, he's been in touch with Schoology. Uh, he's got them on speed dial. So we're definitely aware of it. Um, so yes. So yeah. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks you guys too. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. Thanks Maddie. All right. We have some unfinished business. Um, Anti-racism and quality committee update. If Kelsey All right. Right. I was going to introduce you, Kelsey, but go She's back with us again. Give us an update. Thanks, Kelsey. All right. Um, so the last time we had a school committee meeting, it was right before um, the screening of the documentary, I'm Not Racist, Am I? And then the follow-up video the next day at FRS. Um, so as I'm sure most of you are aware, we had some seventh graders who went rogue in the, the streaming chat of that documentary. Um, started out silly, ended up really racist. Um, so obviously that was upsetting for a lot of our, our students and families. Um, so the following day, Scott did follow up with those students and their families from a discipline perspective. Um, and the seventh grade really spent a lot of time talking about it. Um, and talking about how those comments made the other students feel um, so that the students who were participating could kind of understand the impact of, of those comments and, and how their classmates were feeling about it. Um, and then Amanda was providing, Amanda Mosea, um, provided some affinity space for our students of color um, that they could go and check in with her uh, if they wanted to during the day. Um, and then an apology was made to the organizers and the other participating schools at the following, um, the FERCOG follow-up meeting, uh, which was appreciated. So that was the, that was the downside. Um, the upside was that we had, a, we had sent out a survey at the end of the, the video that we had, we, we'd put together that was an explanation of what is anti-racism, why are we doing this, we talked about um, ending the N-word at Frontier, and we talked about the logo redesign. Um, so we had 470 students respond to our survey. And their option, it was a temperature check kind of survey, and then they also had an, op an opportunity to, to comment and ask some questions. Um, so the temperature check questions, their options were a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or an in the middle, not sure. So ending the N-word, we had 69% thumbs up, 13% in the middle and 18% thumbs down. For the logo redesign, we had 63% thumbs up, 30% in the middle and only 7% thumbs down. And then for the documentary itself, we had 60% thumbs up, 32% in the middle and only 8% thumbs down. So overall, that's a pretty positive response from our student body. Um, and the question that came up the most in the student comments was, when are we doing more of this? When can we have more discussions? We wanna talk about this more. Um, so we know that our students are open to and ready to talk about these, these topics. They're aware that this is something um, that is present in our world today and in our school, and they wanna talk about it. So that's really encouraging. Um, so November 3rd was our full day of anti-racism professional development. So in the morning, um, all of the Frontier Regional staff were working with Radical Empathy Consulting from UMass. Um, they took us through some exercises. And then in the afternoon, there were several different um, workshops to participate in, and that was for both Frontier Regional and the, the elementary schools were able to join us for that as well. Um, so some of those included Elizabeth Pryor um, talking about the use of the N-word in, in an academic setting. Um, and then Amanda did a really nice workshop about responding to parent pushback from parents who are not so sure that, that school is where we should be talking about these things. Um, so on the, the PD front, the elementary schools, as, as Jen told us, are sort of getting to the end of their first round of PD and the high school is about to launch into ours. Um, so we have six more sessions lined up with the uh, Radical Empathy Consulting from UMass that'll be taking us all the way through um, into the spring. So we're excited to be moving forward with that. Um, our peer leadership group, which is our group of ninth through 12th graders, had their second meeting yesterday. 
um, to sort of clarify their vision for the year and talk about what's most important to them this year. And really the message that we're getting from them is they wanna have conversations, which is in, in alignment with what we heard from our survey. Um, and they're really eager to move the conversations that we've been having in that small group out into the larger student body. And how can we do this in a class? How can we do this with elementary schools? And what might that look like in COVID? Um, so they're, they're an awesome, awesome group of students. Um, and we're really excited to be working with them. Um, our logo redesign is moving forward. The deadline for student submissions is November 16th. Um, I've seen a couple of them. They're looking really cool. So the next step of that is the redesign committee will pick um, three options and then the whole school gets to vote. And then at some point we will be um, showing those to you and making sure that, that that's all right with you all as well. Um, from a curriculum standpoint, the eighth grade just started their, their joint ELA and social studies curriculum with the book Stamped, um, which is really exciting. Um, and then Amanda is going to be consulting with our 10th graders who are about to jump into fences. So they've been reading some articles and doing some preparation um, for reading that text because it does use the N-word. Um, and so we, we were doing that in a very mindful way and really framing that for them so that we have that conversation before they encounter that word in the book. Um, and then finally on Thursday, for COG is having their next meeting and we're hoping to get an update from them on the advancement of anti-racism in schools assessment that they're gonna be doing for us. Anybody have any questions for Kelsey? Melissa, Missy? That's okay. Um, I'm, I'm used to it, it's all right. Okay. Um, I guess I, I wanna know uh, if there's anything that you can, kind of elaborate on to maybe help to reassure some parents or students who may have gone through this experience uh, earlier this, or I guess last month, um, and make sure that they have an idea that people are either prepared to have these, that teachers and administrators are prepared to have these conversations, or that, that what you're doing, maybe outside of just this day, is getting them in a space where they're prepared to do it so that as they move forward, it doesn't feel like we're stumbling through these really heavy topics and possibly causing more harm than benefit. Right, right. Um, I think we're starting to do that a little bit uh, with the way that we're having the 10th graders approach fences, for example, and that, that is a template for how we wanna keep moving forward with curriculum. Um, that we're not just like, and we're jumping into this book and we're not really gonna talk about the fact that the N-word comes up. We're, we're having them pre-read articles um, and talk about that content before they get there so that when they, when they are in class and they're reading aloud or they're reading through passages, they know to expect the word, they know how to handle the word in, in the classroom. Um, and then I, I think that students also should hear about what the, the professional development that teachers are doing um, so that they know kind of what's going on with their teachers behind the scenes so that they do have that reassurance that like, yeah, we're, we're open to talking about this. Um, and we're certainly going to be leaning on our, our peer leadership group to, um, to have some of those conversations. Um, not, not that they would be facilitating those conversations, but that they're in the room and they're students who have had some of these conversations already in that small group setting. Um, and they're willing to kind of go into that brave space and take that risk and um, ask some of the more sensitive questions and have those, and get those conversations rolling. And do you get a sense from teachers that they feel well equipped to guide those conversations? At this point, because I, we're so early in the PD, it's a range. There are teachers who feel very confident and are ready to go. Um, and those are the teachers who I think we would be looking at to kind of start having these conversations. And then there are teachers who are feeling like I'm brand new to this and I still need a little bit more of the professional development before I feel totally comfortable jumping in. And then the goal, the goal is with this professional development that we're doing this year, that we're really building the foundation for all of our teachers so that next year everyone is more or less on the same footing. Um, and there aren't really teachers who are saying like, oh, I'm too... Um, you know, I, I, I'm not comfortable doing that. That's the hope. And is there a separate track for the administration? 
Yes, and I believe Darius has an update on that. I do. <laughs> is everybody, is, are people finished with Kelsey? So, um, thank I'm, you, Kelsey. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kelsey. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, so I have a, uh, a quick slideshow, and I'm going to go through a little bit faster than I did with Deerfield. I think I was reading slides, and people kind of got it where like, we could read. I did send it out to all the school committee um, this afternoon, or maybe it was closer to the evening. Um, where's my share screen? Oh, you know what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to try to share my screen differently because they're saying my audio isn't good. So I'm going to go to the Chrome tab. Can you folks see that? Nope. Not yet. You know, it's not going to work this way. All right. Okay. I think there. Um, Darius, do you want me to share? Um, is it the same presentation that Kim had? Um, the issue for, for those of you, I, I'm getting some text. There's, there's only um, nine people watching on the YouTube link, but they're saying they can. I'm becoming out very faint. And I thought if I could open up just the, the link there, um, it would may help that, but um, it didn't work. So um, I was trying to. I was trying. Uh, Darius, does it help if I present my screen? Oh, no, you're presenting here. Sorry. So I have my screen here. I think I, I was just trying to, like I said, help with the um, the faintness. So um, I'm not going to read through parts. I'm going to move a little bit quicker through it than I did the, the previous meeting because we still have a lot to do in this particular meeting. And you can go back to it and read through it. But we have our anti-racism and equity mission. Um, over our overall district goals, and these are the subcommittees um, of our um, um, anti-racism and equity committee um, work. And so um, those are the four subcommittees that we've talked about before. Um, here's our district professional development goals, okay? And, um, and, and Kelsey's talked about this in, in previous days as well. So I'm not gonna read through them all. I'm a little quick and get right to the meat of my kind of thing. Um, so the administrative professional development kind of mission statement is, that is, you know, we believe that anti-racist school leadership is about becoming racially aware and developing skills to dismantle racism um, and associated oppressions in our schools and community. So we kind of have this general overview. And then our guiding questions for the administrative team is what do we need to be to be effective anti-racist leaders? How can we best coach our staff, students, and families in creating anti-racist schools? How do we effectively support anti-racism? Um, subcommittees work in our policies, curriculum, instruction, and professional development. That's a lot of where the, the, the hands-on work is actually happening and how do we um, foster that along and how do we communicate and expand this work with our larger um, community members. So right here is the kind of the meat of the um, professional development. You know, so the, you know, the rollout of the school year, you know, we were, we were going to, um, have um, school committee member, I mean, we're, sorry, I got sidetracked because I got beeped and dinged out here. Um, we were we were going to try to go along with the teachers and right from the beginning, administrators kept on getting pulled away. And I also felt like um, leadership needed more um, and how to guide this through. So we started off, um, obviously, after the September was to, um, we brought in Dr. Elizabeth Pryor from um, Smith College, who has since come back and talked with the staff about use of the N-word in, um, in, in the classroom and when teaching curriculum and how to support teachers and in, the, in that venture. And also we did a lot of side talk. That was the topic of our conversation. But we talked a lot about leadership and how to support in an institution. Um, and I thought our administrative team, just she's a wonderful person. I thought she gave us a lot of insight there. On October 26, we, we joined um, the REI Virtual Groundwater, which is a national, um, national training for leaders. Um, this particular um, uh, training, uh, it was a either morning session for about three hours and an afternoon session, um, you know, basically brought a lot of evidence forward about the racial inequity across multiple systems, not just educations. And it talked about, it gave a lot of facts around what is the, the groundwater problem. And, um, you know, it's going to take more than just small fixes to fix this whole 
um, to fix the inequalities of you know the racial inequality in America. And it's not just the education sector's problem, um, but I think the administrators took a lot of got a lot of data and that kind of thing. It wasn't truly um, the leadership guide that I wanted. Um, and we talked about that as a ministry team. So we're kind of still kind of seeking that leadership guide. In November, um, we had that full day of PD, which was fantastic. Um, you know, and, and thanks um, to the, the crew here at Frontier who put that together, um, working with um, the UMass group. Um, they, they're phenomenal. And I have a, a slide that's going to explain when they're coming back. We are currently also doing a book reading discussion um, between the world and me. Um, as part of the administrative team, um, we're, you know, we divide the book in half and, and we're also doing at the same time, um, listening to the podcast, Nice White Parents. If you haven't listened to that podcast, it's a really, um, it's a wonderful look at good intentions of, um, in this particular case, white parents in New York City public school system, um, thinking they're bringing about change, but not really changing um, the structure of how what was the cause of racism within the school. So it's, it's a nice, it's a nice, it's a well done podcast. And I think it's our January conversation, but I think most administrators have already gotten through it. Um, and then uh, the 22nd is for the elementary, um, is going to continue with their, um, the administrators are working with the elementary schools um, with the different consultants there um, and such. And so, and then in February, March, we have a second book read, um, The Origins of Our um, Discontents. And I'm looking right now for a facilitator for that to um, kind of press us a little bit further um, into, into that book discussion. And I have April right now. It's more of a, uh, to be determined because I'm looking for a more leadership PD. It talk, really talks about, you know, helping principals and other leaders in our in our schools, um, you know, how to support change, you know, in an organization um, and, you know, and obviously support those who are, who are bringing about change. Um, and then like May, in May into summer is we're going to start looking at our next next year's PD um, and, and possibly in our summer, we call it our summer summit, um, you know, bringing in an additional trainer, maybe a continuation from this leadership training we can get in April. So that's overall the um, professional development. Um, and as far as the focus for Frontier Administration, they are joining part of the um, Radical Empathy Consulting Group um, out of um, UMass. And these are the different um, dates coming ahead. They're a little bit, I don't want to use the word behind, they're, I guess you could say a little behind the elementary, got a bigger jump in the beginning of the professional development days. They're, they just started that off in November and those are the dates coming up. Um, and um, I sat in on the November 2nd date of this and this is a really, we were really pleased with this group and um, and so forth. If you have in-depth conversations about this, Sarah's on as well, who kind of put helped put this together. Sarah and I think there were some other people that helped you there, Sarah, I believe. I don't want to. I don't want to thank one person and not thank everyone. So, um, all right. So that's the uh, that's the administrative. I told you I was putting a plan together. To, it's it's kind of along a parallel path, but I do want to try to meet the needs of administrators as well as we go through that. And I still haven't. It's not a hundred percent there yet with that those spring kind of things we put into place. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Okay. We're going to go right into snow days. Hey, can I pop in real quick? Go ahead, Missy. I, can, I, I'm just wondering um, if there's some sense of how to build in sensitivity to our relatively small um, community of color in uh, and, and make sure that we're responding to things that may occur with some sensitivity to how that may feel for them. And I don't know if you have... Uh, reached out to kind of get a sense of how our communication has been to them around some of the stuff after the um, the chat room issue or how we communicate just generally. Um, I can say I'm on the policy and procedures committee and we're really looking about how can we put in procedures that put in greater support, um, you know, around any if there's any kind of uh, incidents of racism, that kind of thing, it's in kind of a more holistic approach rather than just a punitive approach and looking at um, those who may have been affected by it, victims of it and that kind of thing and do a better job there. Um, and I know I have multiple administrators on who could also jump in regarding um, how we followed up to the, the film as well um, that was taken in consideration. And we talked about Amanda Mosea putting on 
Kelsey used a term that I forgot that used there, um, but but we're able to meet with we're able to meet with Amanda to discuss what their feelings were as a former student and a student of color, um, and, and talking through that. Um, and so we're we're building those as we're putting into these 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 systems. Yes, those are good points. And I, I was just thinking about it being more kind of proactive as opposed to reactive. Like how how can we reach out to you and make you feel more a part of this community and uh, as opposed to reactive when things occur. I, I, I don't. Think, okay, thank you. If you don't mind me jumping into areas, um, so. I think for because our, our students of color are such a small population, I think that giving them choice and autonomy is really important. Um, I'm sorry, my dog has chosen right now to drink behind me. Um, so some of the some of the comments that we got in the survey from our BIPOC students um, were, especially our younger BIPOC students, were, I don't want to be singled out. Like I don't want everyone to look at me. Um, you know, very, very like, listen, I'm keeping my head down and I'm doing my thing and like, don't, don't like, don't make this a thing. Um, so I think having, Amanda does want to be available. She's hoping to have like a bi-weekly after school group um, where students can come and speak in a group of just BIPOC people and really talk about like, what's going on? How does this feel? What's coming up for you? Um, but we did only have one student who um, used her affinity space on that Tuesday, um, which does, you know, isn't to say that there weren't more students who would have benefited from it. Um, but I think giving, making sure that they've just got that choice and that autonomy of like, hey, this is something that's available to you. And if you, if you don't want to engage in it, that's totally fine. Um, but it, it's a tricky balance of, um, it's a tricky balance of making sure that they feel supported without making without making them feel like there's a huge spotlight on them, which is tough in this particular population. Totally, I get that. Thank you, Darius. Did you see that message? Yeah, that apparently I'm the only one people can't hear, which is probably a blessing to some. But you know, <laughs> I got two computers going. Maybe I'll try to log on to the meet on this screen, and maybe that'll do something okay but carry on okay anybody else have any questions well we're going to bring up snow days now so or george could maybe say something about the snow days or something i don't have anything to say about snow days i don't think <laughs> that's more darius's realm i think okay i just see there was a our remote days update you know that's you know so what I'm going to do? Oh, that's, that's not going to work. <laughs> His update here that was, was that cool. snow days are going to what be. What I'm going to do is I'm going to. All right, we see if this works. Um, someone, Jessica, text me if you're watching if this is working. It takes a, there's a 10 second feed, but I'm going to try to go to a different computer that's on a different account because we're talking. Um, Snow days in general just was just an update. You, I said I sent out a message to everybody, just letting everybody know that we are. I just wanted to make sure I, had, I completed the loop talking with all of you. Um, that you know we will have remote days for snow days unless we're getting crushed with snow. Um, so I think what the issue is is that if I go on a separate computer rather than the one I'm streaming from, they can hear me. So I'm going to go over here. So okay. Um, okay. so that's it is on snow days. Okay. Um, Next is um, we're going to vote on a couple policies that we reviewed since last last meeting. Um, does anybody have any questions about ACAB or DEDH? Um, so just to let people know, the only update we had on the the first one, um, the anti discrimination, is we did remove all the names that was suggested by the school committee that um, we removed the names of who held the positions within the policy and just made it general. So that's the one change you'll see. Phil, did you have a question? Yeah, um, when I when I was going through that, there was a couple of, uh, so um, there's a couple of uh, questions. F first of all, in the chat, Roman numeral three of the ACAB one, it seemed like there was a, a word missing that school, the Frontier Regional School before the word committee in, in the, Last last sentence, last sentence of the first paragraph. 
it just talks about the word committee, but throughout that policy, there had been no reference to any committee at all. So um, I, I, I assume it means that the regional school committee, I thought it should probably specify that. And then in the, in the title, uh, the title nine, the Roman numeral nine part, where it says that the school gets, the school has act, actual notice. If any school employee has notice, uh, um, I believe that includes school committee members. I believe we're, we're considered in school employees. Um, so I, and that to me, it seems like a, a, a bit of a reach if it's really has to be any school employees as opposed to full-time school employees or, uh, people on the payroll of the school. I don't know, but I certainly didn't want to be, uh, but, I mean, just in the course of my 10 years, I there's numerous times individual employees have made complaints to in my presence. So I don't want that to be noticed for the school. Um, I'd like to just be able to say, talk to Darius about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's on that last statement, Phil, the policy does apply to all, everyone in the school community. So it does, you know, it says in the bottom of that first paragraph, associated with the educational community, including but not limited to students, district employees, school committee, school volunteers, and independent contractors. I mean, I'd have to get legal well, like guidance if you do something wrong, Phil. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, why do I get dragged into this? All right. <laughs> Missy, did you have something, Missy? I did, but I found it, uh, so I'm I'm good. Okay. And does anybody have anything? Uh, are we going to vote on these separately, Darius? So I need a motion on ACAB. So moved. Do second. I have a second? Missy? Yep. A second. Do you want to vote them together or do them individually, Bob? Why don't, we, why don't we vote them together to make it easy for you? Okay. I need a motion on BEDH. So moved. Missy, second. Okay. Uh, roll call Bob Halla? Yes. Lynn Roberts? Yeah. I'm going to go first names only. Phil? Yes. Judy, yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Uh, just real quick, I'm sorry, I stepped away to the uh, bathroom. What are we voting on? <laughs> We're voting on policy ACAB and BEDH together. Uh, okay. Yes. Thanks, Damien. Keith? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, awesome. Keith, you there? Yes. Uh, Missy? Yes. Olivia? Yes. All right. We're all set, Bill. We're all set, Bob. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We got some new business. Uh, MAS, MASC. Uh, Mr. Decker is going to get a Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, Darius and I still don't know who who uh, put in for his Lifetime Achievement Award. Maybe he put it in for himself. I haven't <laughs> asked him that question yet. But um, we, uh, Darius and I wanted to recognize him during our school committee meeting that he is going to get a lifetime achievement award. So, so don't know who who put in for him. Maybe the the lady from Lee put it in for him or something. Uh, who knows? Yes, Phil. I sent an email to them. I don't know. I I think other people did too. But okay. Um, but we uh, we ought to do something for the guy. We ought to. Yeah, I actually thought I went to the meeting on Saturday, and they and they talked about that too I, and i was actually surprised i'm like oh really i sat there thinking oh bob really should get this he really should yeah now is there some type of plaque I, i'm pretty sure they're going to get some type of plaque or something there, uh, there were no plaques that i saw on my screen so yeah but that would be exciting okay maybe well, we should can we do a formal something for him in some capacity I think we, so we have several things that we have a couple members on different committees where we need to recognize their years of service. 
Mm -hmm. uh, people kind of slipped away in the digital, disappeared in the digital universe where we don't, um, haven't had their proper goodbyes and our proper thank yous in a public setting. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll put something together. Um, I don't know if we should try to do it digitally or if we should just wait until, well, when Missy thinks it's okay for us to be, <laughs> be hopeful to be back to school. Uh, no, but uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I want to do something and we'll talk about it. We'll, we'll put something together. But that, that came across my desk and I want to make sure we didn't lose track of it. So now that it's in the minutes, we'll, we'll do something for those who have served um, before we first. Yeah, Bob deserves it. Okay, um, community health indicators. This must be time for Meg and to come on and help us out. Right? Yep. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen again, but this time I got the other screen going so people can hear me. And then... Um, Ah, no cheating. <laughs> All right. So, so um, maybe just kind of set you up. I, I, at Deerfield, just for time wise, I just highlighted the, the changes that we were talking about. Um, and just to kind of set the thing. So, we, we decided we had to create new health indicators because they were changing. And then we sent them off to the boards of health to say, this is what we're thinking about the changes. And then we sent them out, what, Monday or something like last week? And then the state changed them on Friday after some of the boards of health met to discuss these. So we kind of have to redo them. And, you know, I think Jessica's uh, statement earlier, we can kind of comment about that as we go through. Um, but Meg, I'll, I'll let you kind of go take it from here, okay? Okay. Um, so um, quickly, there's the stuff I always put there. And, um, you know, really it comes down to um, masks, masks, masks. <laughs> <laughs> and physical distancing. Um, the other things are important still as well, but um, uh, you can go. So in terms of the data sources, um, there's nothing really different there in terms of what um, the primary things we're looking at. Um, uh, the state data and then the Public Health Institute of Western Mass is where we get our county level data. So this is the new, it's, it's a little small on this slide, I apologize. This is, a, this is the chart from, um, from, from uh, DPH and um, there's a correction on there. And so apologies to Jessica or others. Um, I had written average daily cases and it's actually an incident rate. Um, but, um, you know, so the highlighted information is really just um, the new um, kind of thoughts from uh, from Desi in terms of what a community would do in response to these. Um, you know, and I think um, I'll follow up with you at some point, if, if I may, to just um, go through some of your calculations. Um, I will be honest, I'm very tired and I didn't follow all of what you were doing. So I'd love to, to talk with you about that another time. But, um, you know, all of our towns are under 5,000. Um, and so this is sort of, um, I don't know, I think it's self-explanatory. This is what the state has. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. This is just, that's an old map. But basically, the, I think what we, the, the highlight of what's coming out from DESE is they're basically, so, you know, remember when we put this together, we had to come up with some sort of metrics in August before the state came out with metrics. And then the states come out with metrics a couple of times and they've changed kind of things. But I think in our working with the local boards of health, the one thing the local board of health said that the state metrics are fine and colorful, but we're going to look at the data that we have in front of us and we're going to make decisions about the school and the metrics kind of from the very beginning, it was like the metrics be, be darned, you know? And so, you know, you know, we, and so, Basically, what the state is saying that you need to be in the week, you have to be in the red for three weeks before you start to consider closing schools. Our conversation with local boards of health is that they're not following that model. They're going to be looking for, Meg, I'll, I'll let you kind of take it from there, but you know, right. they're going to be looking for community spread and cases that are going to be affecting the school. Right. And I mean, I think what I was going to what I was going to say as we go through is that really the biggest change we made to our metrics is to take out some of the hard and fast trigger points in terms of what would happen. Um, when a data threshold was was reached, because I think the thing that we that we learned as we went along um, 
is is the nuance and is um you know that we we really need to be working with our local boards of health on the context of any of the data points um you know and i think certainly earlier this uh fall when we had the windstorm and sunderland all of a sudden was red um you know according to the metric um you know that was a closure um but then when when darius talked with <clears throat> Caitlin Rock and I talked with Caitlin Rock and their board of health in Sunderland had an emergency meeting. It was really clear that uh, of the 11 cases, 10 were uh, higher ed, the cluster at UMass. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I don't know what got in my throat. So really it's that, uh, you know, any of the data thresholds are gonna be a consult uh, with our local board of health, um, an individual or a four town level. Um, and we're also, you know, we're also trying to pull data from neighboring municipalities. So I'm often in conversation with Greenfield public health nurse to find out what's happening there and to try and get a sense of uh, when there are increasing cases in Franklin County you know, what's happening. Um, and certainly we saw uh, it when there were increases earlier in October related to um, a couple of events um, inside, no masks, no social distancing, um, and then a, 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 rec, re, a rec sports uh, events that again, were not following the safety protocols of the state uh, caused a couple of clusters. Um, <clears throat> so this does have, you know, the, I, we really didn't change, I mean, we changed this first one to sort of um, reflect what DESE is requiring and uh, Deerfield is still, as far as I know, they haven't changed language about the indicator of municipalities. And I think for us, um, it makes sense to sort of stick with that. I did change the threshold for the county data. Um, and this is based on, um, uh, there's a risk assessment report that came out October 14th and that um, utilizes that CDC um, risk assessment data. But basically for Franklin County, and this is a solid, this is just a count. This isn't a rate or anything. It's just a straight, straight out count that as long as cases in Franklin County as a whole are below 50. Um, and that's excluding, you know, congregate, again, the, the, the kind of nursing home, correctional facility or higher ed and it would be, again, it would be a consult. Um, and then we didn't change these last uh, sort of more local and internal data points. Um, we would, um, <clears throat> if we had cases that uh, um, I added these slides about the rapid uh, mobile testing unit from the state, and that's to test asymptomatic um, uh, members of a school community. Um, and basically, they, there's pretty uh, scripted criteria for requesting it. Um, and I basically, you know, I looked at what they had and I kind of said, you know, look, honestly, if we have two cases, we're asking for it. Um, we're going to ask uh, two cases in a school. We're going to ask to have them mobilize that. Um, and again, you know, any closure is is really for us to assess what's going on and, you um, all of our mitigation strategies are are uh, effective. This is just more about the mobile testing. And there's their criteria is on the last slide. <laughs> um, so it's you know it come it really does come down to conversations with our local board of health and what's happening in the community. What you know what information they have because there there will be information that they have that we. Do. Um, about the cases in our community and and where those cases are and the and as Darius as you said the real question is are we in, um, you know isolated uh, cases uh, groups of cases are we seeing community transmission and in really for us the question is are we seeing anything that suggests to us that there's um, potential for spread within the school so Phil. So Meg, just about the, the mobile <coughs> testing unit, I don't know what the, has there been a protocol about what's going to happen if one is called, you know, is is each town's emergency uh, 
management coordinator are going to be brought in to use the uh, the, the dial record the, the recording dial for every number in town. To, no, no, um, it, it would it would be it would be specifically for a school community. For the, for the, the family. School. Right. And the, state, the, state would, the state would come in. We have um, permission slips for students and for staff. Um, so it, it, it would be where there was concern about cases within a school that raised a question of transmission within the school. And it would be a way to do, um, you know, testing anybody who was considered, um, you know, exposed within the cohorts or the class or the learning group. Um, and Certainly at the high school, uh, middle school and high school, we get into larger learning groups by the time you, you kind of look at where everybody is. And again, that is to test asymptomatic people to see if, if there is more happening than what we're aware of so that we can um, respond to it um, quickly. Okay, thanks. Good question. M Missy? Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Does the state pick up the cost for that testing? Yeah. Yeah. They show up, they do it all. All we have to do is um, hand them the permission, the sign permission slips. And we have those forms ready to just be run off if we were to need them. Anybody else have any questions for Meg? Thanks, Meg. You are welcome. Have, we, have a nice night. Thanks, you too. Okay, phase three hybrid planning. Who's up, Darius? <laughs> so, yep. So basically, we, you know, where I'm at now with the um, a couple of weeks ago, I met with the administrative team and we started talking about all right. So we've been we were a few weeks in, not a few weeks, we we're about a month and a half in. Um, we got to start looking at about what does the next phase look like, and so I charged with each principal to start um, working um, within their buildings to figure out. What can phase three look like? And so tonight we have a kind of a draft form, right? I think Sarah or Georgia, I think, I don't know, is it Sarah, are you leading the charge on this one? Or sure. George, are you going to fight Sarah on that? <laughs> no, he's going to, he's just going to bail me out if it, if it all goes south. Um, yeah. So we, so we've been talking about next steps. I mean, um, frankly, we're, we're really grateful to still be in school at this point. I mean, we really didn't know what was going to happen. We started out in September. And then as the cases started to rise, we thought, oh, no, here it comes. Um, and we're just uh, for every day that we can keep our students in school, um, we feel we feel good about it um, because they're really getting a lot um, out of the experience. We have had a phenomenon where a lot of our um, not a lot, but a number of our high school students have decided to um, go remote um, even after the fact. And I think part of that is. Um, um, socially what's going on. Uh, so if your friends aren't there, then, you know, you might as well uh, get the social someplace else and uh, use school for just your work. And I think one of the things that's happened is because the remote and the in-person learning are so aligned um, that students can afford to stay home if they need to and participate in their classes remotely. And I think that's been a really a huge advantage of what's happening. Um, and it's a real advantage when you think about students um, maybe waking up with a sore throat or something, and it's just not a big deal to, to opt out and stay home for that day. Um, so, but we are looking at um, what are the next steps um, as far as uh, bringing more students back in person. And we did put together a, a draft um, document, and we're looking at um, really targeting our students that are not doing well with this remote learning um, plan and adding days to their schedule. So adding, so instead of them coming um, two days in person, uh, they would be coming three days in person. We do have a number of students that are already in the building uh, for three days and some students that are in the building for four days, um, but their third and their fourth day are remote learning that just is happening in school. So we would be looking at taking those students um, and integrating them into their classes so they'd be fully participating in classes uh, for an additional day of learning. Um, so we've been very um, conscious of what the numbers will do in each classroom. We still are very committed to um, keeping students six feet apart in the classroom. Um, and so we're not exceeding those numbers. So what that means is for uh, the middle school classes, 
we can accommodate them eventually. So this is the next part. So phase, for the, so our first part of phase three is bringing in our high need students. And so that's about 30 students in each end of the building, 30 students in the middle school and 30 students in the high school. The next part or the real, tr the honest to goodness phase three is bringing in middle school students for a third day of learning. So we're looking at the earliest date that that could possibly happen would be December 7th because we're really conscious of the Thanksgiving holiday that's coming up and we wanna make sure that we allow enough time after that holiday uh, for things to settle down again. So we don't even have a, a hard fast date on that because we really do need to see what happens with the health situation. But for our high need students, uh, we're gonna be starting to roll them in slowly um, starting next week. I don't know if that makes sense. And if anybody want, once again, I shared uh, I shared a link to the document to the to the phase through to the draft. Uh, it, I, I shared a link to it in the principal's report. If anybody wants to, if, if you want to take a look at it, yeah, we put in a lot of. There's a bunch of logistical details at the bottom that you don't really need to know, but they are kind of interesting. You know, some of the other planning that has to happen around all of this, like where where do we move lunch because we want to make sure that we keep the distance in the cafeteria. How do we keep groups separate? You know, so you can kind of get a sense of of some of the other logistical pieces that go along with um, with increasing the number of days the kids come. Thanks, Sarah and George. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Missy. Sorry. Have you contacted Polly Wozni and had her uh, coordinate with you guys? I know she's a she's a mastermind of of figuring out where people should go and timing and all of that. Yeah, she is she is one of the most organized people that I know. In yeah. my head, I'd like her in roller skates like Abby on NCIS. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, perfect analogy. Yeah. Thank you. Um, athletics, fall sports, planning for the winter sports. Yeah, so I throw that, I threw this on there when I was developing the. Uh, the agenda uh, to find out where we're at right now, we're at the point where um, administration has met um, the the county is still trying to figure out what sports they're going to allow because we have to kind of work together about who's playing who and that kind of stuff. Um, and so, you know, looking at their our winter sports offerings, um, for those who aren't following the athletics day to day, there it's basketball, wrestling, um, uh, hockey, um, cheer, and skiing. Skiing. And so the idea is we're trying to figure out what the best way to how to approach those sports, how much risk is is in those sports. Basketball is obviously a pretty much can be an in-your-face sport and in, in how we're going to approach this and what are the other schools going to do. Um, you know, the issue, you know, just to have really briefly, we don't have a, a decision yet because it's kind of in a decision-making phase right now. Um, but, you know, the concern, one of the concerns I have, I, I hit both sides. I think the athletics – this fall being outdoors has been a savior for a lot of our students um, and trying to get those other things up and running that we do those extracurriculars um, to get them, you know, I think, I think the days the kids have practice are their favorite days of the week. Um, you know, even if they weren't involved in an actual sports pro uh, varsity program, you know, they had to do the, the practices thing. I'm speaking from my own children's experience. Um, so we want to make sure we do something. Um, but we also, at the same time, right now, most of Franklin County is remote um, for their high schools. And so it's, you know, we're playing a different kind of game if we're going to be playing other schools where we could be closing down education and how we're doing it. And they're not really as much. So, you know, we kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, you know, what is the level? And then, you know, can we do scheduling that doesn't have us go to multiple schools in the same week? Those kind of ideas that, that go out there if we do keep a varsity program. I think no matter what we do, I think um, George, Scott, um, even and Sarah agree that whatever we do, we have to put it. If we don't have athletics to some level, we got to replace it with intramurals that are kind of um, they're cooked up and we can play each other and that kind of stuff. Um, maybe smaller groups, not full five on five, smaller amounts, four and four, whatever we have for participation. Um, you know, if that's basketball and then maybe even other activities. But we got to keep the kids active because. Um, I really am concerned overall about 
isolation in the winter, it's already a, a poor model of people being isolated as well. And I think we're gonna see, we're already hearing about our, the agencies around us that deal with um, health, uh, mental health issues of, of people um, are seeing, you know, there's more than enough, they can't more cases than they can handle. Um, and if you're talking about, you're seeing the rise of, you know, abuse of alcohol and all the other kind of things and, and what's happening in households, um, we gotta be there to provide those outlets for students um, and um, and take care of their mental health as well. So um, anyway, and I think activity is important in there. It's not just athletics, but other clubs and stuff and how can we get those going as well. George, you wanna jump in at all? You got a better handle on some of the other stuff that's going on. In terms of athletics? No, you, I, other stuff, I said. <laughs> Olivia's got a question too, George, too. So. so, yeah, I mean, do you want me to give my report now? Can I, is that what you're asking? Why don't you, why don't you wait? Olivia's got a question about probably about fall, uh, winter sports, Olivia. Uh, I just wanted to kind of, I'm not <laughs> sure if I'm hearing this correctly. So um, we're considering wrestling with other schools. And then those kids are going to come and sit in the classroom with our kids, like, is that we're really considering? And I'm just asking because, um, it, you know, there's ways that we could change, you know, field hockey a little bit so they're not so close, or you know, maybe even basketball. But wrestling just seems like it's really hard. And I get like we can't just say, okay, well, I guess we could, but you don't really want to be like, oh, sorry, not you for sports. Um, I think nothing's been finalized, so I just want to be careful that I pre-release. Um, but the, I think wrestling might be following the rule, the role of like what football did in doing workouts and not playing right. wrestling as we know wrestling. You know, they could be weight training and doing other things to keep them the, that group active and such. Um, <laughs> I don't see wrestling as we know it happening. Okay, sure. Sorry, wrestlers right. out there. But I think that makes okay. me Scott, I'm sorry, I didn't see there, Scott. Go ahead, Scott. That makes me feel a little better. Um, and Olivia. I think intramural things are really awesome idea. I would help support that however I could. I think you're right. These kids absolutely need an active outlet. Um, and I think sports are fantastic, you know, but, you know, inside sports have their own issues, of course. So, um, so thank you. Yeah. I also have to plug in because I was um, talking with a student regarding, and I was hoping, George, you were going to jump in on this, but they're talking about how they can do a play um, and, 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 they're, and they're trying to put things together so to bring the arts um, the, the back as well. So, George, do you have any and that is something, that? And, and that is something that I can, I apologize. I was a little slow in the, up, uh, little slow in the uptake there, Darius. My bad. No, but one of the things that we've, we've actually had the opportunity to uh, to meet with Dave Peck, and it's and he has been meeting with his uh, with his with his drama students, uh, and they are exploring the idea of doing uh, of doing a play and doing it virtually, um, and 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 they're hopeful that's going to happen, uh, and we're also hopeful that uh, there will be some configuration uh, of a musical or something happening in the spring. Um, you know the folks that the, Max and Christina, who were you know were really um, integral in, in in bringing that to life last spring. Uh, you know they're they're exploring ideas as to what they can do um, moving forward this year under the current under the current system. So so we're hopeful that we can that we can keep the arts going in that respect as well. So um, I think that that I think that that's fa that would be fantastic. Thanks, George. Um. Capital planning. So capital planning, as, as we know, we have a capital planning subcommittee. So I guess this was just an overview of where we are going into the capital planning subcommittee. So I shared while you were on this meeting, I actually realized I didn't share it with you earlier with the other stuff that I shared. Um, I did share with you our new form. Um, um, whoop. I forget, I got to share it on this screen. <sighs> I, I, I'm losing my mind. I don't want to just <laughs> losing my mind. All right, so basically, whoop, wrong. Um, basically, you have all this at home, but um, our wonderful Shelly put together um, an update to last year's form, and basically, um, you have this so you can play around and look at. But this is where we are at the beginning of the process. That subcommittee has not gone through it yet. Um, you know, and we're looking at possibly having a meeting um, next Wednesday. I'm waiting to hear back from all the committee members if they can make it. 
Um, but I was just kind of going through the layout of it again. I think it's important that we leave what's been completed on there for at least a few years. So people who said, didn't we just do this? They can say, we, you know, we, we, we're sharing this kind of thing, um, you know, with uh, you know, the select boards and those kind of things and to see what we've been completing, where the taxpayer's money's gone. If you scroll to the right, um, we've actually even put in what year we requested it, what year was funded, the approved amount, the actual spent, and the remaining funds from each of those things. So even stronger tracking of our capital. Remember we talked about, you know, did we, but I, I talked about um, really I wanted to be as transparent as possible in the capital projects. People should see what's coming. They should see what we've done, um, that kind of thing. And with that transparency, we get more buy-in, hopefully, to fund what we need to get funded. So just as an overview, and, I'll, and I'm just going to go briefly because it's going to go to the subcommittee and then come back. Um, but a lot of the projects that some of the projects that we approved last year, um, as you can see here, you know, again, our number system is one is things that we'd be looking to get done this year. Two is something that possibly next year, maybe get moved up to, to one, depending on how the finances work. And three is basically on the radar. Um, and if you can go down, there's a long list of stuff that we have on that we haven't gone through because we know this is going to be a more difficult year financially for the town. So I don't think we've gone crazy about numbering everything through, but we got to redo the numbering on that as part of our committee. Um, remember that just this committee rem remind this committee that we did a freeze on the approved expenditures out of E and D last spring. So those first three things were approved by you. So you're like, didn't we already do that? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you you did approve that, but. We froze it because we were very concerned about what is this COVID going to bring, and so on and so forth. And so, I think the subcommittee is going to have to go through to, to just help um, help us all decide about how we should manage this moving forward. So, I guess that's really all I want to do is just a quick overview of that we're starting this process, and um, I think we can get our our capital plan in by you know by early by early January or even December where they. Where we had it in the past, I don't think the COVID is going to change that. Um, we can always put a request in and then modify it down if we have to or up. Maybe. Darius, can I make two comments? You sure. Um, on those three projects that we did hold off on that were approved last year, those will have to be revoted if they're reprioritized as one still. Um, just to make that clear for everyone. And then the independent auditing firm, Scanlon's office, is currently doing our audit and assessing E&D. So hopefully we'll have more info by the um, capital planning meeting. I certainly have an, an estimate on the number, um, but we don't have the exact figure for excess and deficiency yet, which is part of the capital conversation. Was the... Um was the money put aside for those three projects originally, Shelley? And will it? And if we have to revote on, it, is that money going back in? Will that put us over the five percent? No. So when I had done the calculation last year, it was with keeping that in E and D, not spending it because we weren't sure what we were going to need to support this year. So what we basically did was took that money off of the books to be used, put it back into E and D, and it shouldn't put us over at all. Um, like I said, you would just have to revote on it. We hadn't started any of the projects. We hadn't encumbered any of the funds. So we couldn't keep them going into a new year um, because nothing had been started yet since we froze the budget. And I think also remember, we didn't have all the COVID grants at the time. You know, that the, the $100,000 that we held back um, was going to be for the things that we needed to do in order to get school in a hybrid model. How are we doing on supplies, Darius? Overall, I mean, are we are we doing all right on supplies? You know, masks. PPEs, but, yeah, the COVID PPEs. Yeah, we're doing fine. Okay. Um, I think um, I'll be honest. I haven't double checked that recently, but in the sense of we didn't go burn through them nearly as as much as we. I mean, a lot of the problems that we projected ahead just didn't occur. You know, having to provide students with a lot of masks we didn't happen. Most people, you know, masks is a fashion statement, and we all know. Um, so, you know, there's not a lot of paper masks being yeah. handed out or whatever you call them, you know, and a lot of the other kind of the number of gowns a nurse is going to have to go through on a daily basis. You have to be prepared, but it's just we've been fortunate enough to have to use them as much as um, we had planned for, which is good. I can speak to that a little bit as well. Um, I think Darius is really 
spot on there as far as masks and gowns, some of those pieces. We are still having a hard time getting KN95s and N95 masks for um, staff that need them. Um, and then the other thing that's been difficult to get is gloves. Um, we've had a hard time getting our hands on our, on a restock. We have supplies still and orders are in process, but those are just a couple of the harder things that we've had um, trouble getting. Thank you. Judy? Can I, yeah, can I just, I went back and read your uh, meeting invite, Darius, and it said it's like an opt out only. So I just assumed if you can go, you don't say anything. So, because the way you stated it, it was like, oh. Darius is frozen. No, I was frozen. <laughs> he was thinking. Frozen in thought. Yeah. <laughs> out of what? commentary from Judy Pierce over here. So, popped out for what? The, the meeting on the 18th. It was both like only let you know if you can't attend. So I just was like, oh, of course oh, I can yeah. attend. So I'm not going to say anything. So I'm just assuming we're having the meeting. So book it. We're having the meeting. <laughs> Great. Yeah, we're good. Good. Ditto, ditto for me. Well, thanks, Phil. Thanks for that clarification. <laughs> I'm not trying to you harass know. you, Darius. <laughs> I'm like, okay. did I misunderstand it? Because it's only like 8,000 emails a day. Okay, reports. I have nothing. We, uh, Lynn, we have anything from the collaborative? Uh, yeah, just a couple things. Um, they wanted to me to remind you that they are offering free accessibility audit audits of district websites. Um, so they can point out areas of issues for students with situational limits or disabilities. Um, so they've got people who will look at our website and make sure that it's accessible to everybody. And uh, Bill Deal is retiring in December. That's it. Thank you. George, we got your report. Do you want to add anything to it? I don't need to add anything to it, but just one of the things that Lynn just mentioned just sort of sparked something in my head. Um, with just so you guys also know, with our um, the school council that 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 meets uh, once a month, one of the things that we're looking at right now is actually updating is updating our website. We're we're entitled to um, a free upgrade, and so you know one of the things that we're looking at um, because you know because so much more is happening online now. Uh, we are looking to update our website, so it's it's a it's a bit of a drawn out process. Um, but um, we've already met with Scott Paul, uh, and we've started looking at some of the the templates that 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 they offer to us. And so we're hoping we can move along with that. Um, and yeah, no, you guys, and, and that's I, I, that's something that's not on my report. So um, other than that, I think you guys can probably check out the report. If you have any questions, just just let me know. And thank you. Thanks, George. Um, Darius, you want to add chime in? With nope, I don't have a report. Um, I will say that our our, our uh, current website does have the handicap uh, rating, so we, we have that done already. So we'll make sure we get it on the new site as well. And our Chromebooks came in for high school, for middle oh, and high school. Really? Yeah, that's great. That's good news. And we are going to executive session. Nope. Hey, just short of nope. two hours. Uh, does anybody want to share anything before we say good night? I need a motion and a second and a roll call. Don't move. Adjourn. Don't move. Second. Olivia's got a second. Go ahead, Judy. Uh, Bob? Yep. Lynn? Yep. Bill? Yes. Judy, oh. yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yep. Uh, Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Excellent. 851. Good night, everybody.